On today's edition of the Locked On Eagles podcast, it's the first episode of Stock Up, Stock Down for the 2023 season. Who shined and who struggled in the Eagles' nail-biting 25-20 victory over the New England Patriots? All that and more coming up on this Tuesday edition of the Locked On Eagles podcast. You are Locked On Eagles, your daily Philadelphia Eagles podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Making Locked On Eagles your first listen each and every day. Welcome in Eagles fans to a Tuesday edition of the show. Shout out to our everydayers for making us your first listen Monday through Friday right here on the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Today's episode is brought to you by Prize Picks, the easiest and most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Go to prizepicks.com slash locked on NFL and use the promo code in all lowercase locked on NFL for a first deposit match up to $100. I'm Louis DiBiase, joined as always by Gino Camilleri, and we are continuing to recap a wild first win for the Birds, week one against the New England Patriots, 25-20. to And Gino, again, we're going to go over all the ups and downs of that roller coaster ride, a 16 to nothing lead, quickly gets a race, 16-14. to New England knocking on the door in the fourth quarter. The Birds hold on with three red zone stands to hold them to no points. So, we'll, again, stock up, stock down. There's a lot of guys that shined, but there are a lot of people that struggled on both sides of the ball, too. One thing about that game that we haven't talked about yet, it was a little costly when it comes to the health of this roster, and that's something that me and you were very accustomed to talking about on this podcast, i.e. 2018 to 2020. But last year in 2022, we did not have to worry about injuries for most of the season. It was unprecedented how healthy they were last year. And that's not the realistic reality of the NFL. And the Eagles saw that quickly to start this season. So James Bradbury right now is in concussion protocol. Head coach Nick Sirianni, not sure, likely not going to play against Minnesota this Thursday with a short week. Nicobe Dean placed on short-term IR with a foot injury. That's going to keep him out for likely a month. Fletcher Cox got a little banged up, although he is good to go. This is the real NFL, and you're going to have to deal with this adversity and overcome injuries, and your depth of this roster is definitely going to be tested on Thursday night against Minnesota. Now, was it as bad as the Baltimore Ravens who lose no. J.K. Dobbins, Marcus, Marcus Williams, Williams Ronnie year? Stanley yes. all in the same game? No, Absolutely it wasn't. Again, not. it was not 2018-2020 Eagles for sure. It's definitely one of those things that you have to figure out in terms of depth. Up especially yep. in terms of linebacker. But I look at it and say, man, thank God it happened now, right? Because sure. the games that you're playing, you got Minnesota coming up next. Then you have Tampa Bay. It's a little bit easier to navigate this stretch than it would be, heck, if this happens in that five-game stretch where you're playing those juggernauts of Kansas City, Buffalo, Dales. Yeah, then we then we are going to have some issues, right, Lou? But it's one of those things that coming out of that game, to win that game, and not have a loss with those injuries, it's that much better. Because if you have that loss on a short week, out James Bradbury, you could have potentially out Fletcher Cox. Yeah. You're going to be out in a Kobe. Trying you know, not to go down 0-2. Yeah. Potentially must-win situation where Minnesota's in that same type of mindset. I look at this team now, they got punched in the face, but they made it out of there. It's a, it's a good learning tool to take away what week one was this year because it was very reminiscent to week one last year, Lou, and you made a great point. Where did they turn around week two primetime yep. Minnesota Vikings? It's setting up very nicely to hopefully have the same thing happen again, but yeah. that bug did bite for sure. So for James Bradbury, again, concussion protocol, not a long-term injury. He should be back soon, but this is a big test for Josh Job. stepped up in a tremendous way on Sunday, that fourth mm -hmm. down play, making sure he pushed the receiver out before he got two feet in. Because if that receiver catches the football, the Patriots are set up on, what, the three or four yard line with a chance to go win the game. So Job, a big moment. But now he's going to have to play an entire game. And I don't know what Sean Desai is going to do when it comes to Darius Slay versus Justin Jefferson. I hope, unlike Jim Schwartz and Jonathan Gannon for the most part, he would have Slay shadowing Jefferson. But mm -hmm. if not... Job's going to have to cover at times the best receiver in football. And even when he's not, Jordan Addison's a really good rookie that scored a deep touchdown on Sunday. So he's going to have a test. He's going to have a test, but I don't think the linebackers without N'Kobe Dean and the safeties will be as tested as much as they were against sure. New England because Minnesota does not have yeah. a duo of Hunter Henry and no. Mike Gesicki out there. They do have TJ right? Hawkinson, though. 
Oh, they definitely do, but now you just have one guy to worry about instead yeah. of two of them. And that... thank God, man, because this linebacker core looks it was thin with Dean. It was bad. I mean, they signed Rashad Evans today to the practice squad and they're they're pretty desperate right now. And I would say that you can't even go into this game without playing Sidney Brown like you did week one because you're gonna need somebody to fly around and make tackles with you're three three safeties, shit. right? I mean I, I expect that, right? Because Terrell Edmonds is probably your best matchup for TJ Hawkinson, in my opinion, right now. And yeah, the guys outside, if you do shadow with Slay on Justin Jefferson, then you can worry about sending safety help to Job side with Addison. But it's going to be a different approach, and that's the thing. With these injuries, how quickly can you figure that out on a short week? Because your game plan was that you were going to have N'Kobe Dean being your green dot caller, probably being the guy who does have to take on those matchups. I mean, he was defending Gasicki and Hawkinson at time, or not Hawkinson, um, Hunter Henry, mm -hmm. and he probably would have done that in week two, which they had anticipated on a short week. Well, now your hands are strapped behind your back and you're out him and James Bradbury on defense, where you already lost a lot of starters from last year. So Sean Desai, as good as his defense was, he has to step up in a big way come this he Thursday. Does. But more question marks lie in the healthier offense, which has all of its tools at its disposal. And they didn't have the best game yesterday. Yeah, I will say, though, Gino, going back to N'Kobe Dean, we talked about in the offseason, like we did a Jenga piece episode, who the mm. players you just cannot afford to lose the most. N'Kobe Dean was one of them because – Again, now it's like Dean's out, and we didn't really know what Dean was going to be. We had a lot of hope for him for sure. They put a lot in him this year because mm -hmm. they let TJ Edwards walk and Kazir White, both of your starters. And now with him out, it's, okay, is it Christian Ellis and Zach Cunningham, who had a brutal game in coverage on Sunday? Is it, you know, Nicholas Morrow called up from the practice squad? Rashad Evans started 17 games for Atlanta last year. Is on a short week, is he ready to go? Most likely not. Mm -hmm. um, regardless, the personnel is not great. And I don't know, again, there's probably not a, a quick fix that Howie Roseman can just bring somebody in. You're going to need to get by until Dean returns. And I think, again, the the right way to go about this is probably just more defensive backs being on the field. Yeah, more nickel, more dime Or do you use Nolan Smith more as off-ball linebacker? He really didn't play much on mm -hmm. Sunday. I don't know. We'll see. They tried it a little bit in training camp, but I think yeah. on that Jenga episode, we said that the best approach would be keep as little amount of linebackers on the field. You have better depth and more players at safety. If you get Sidney Brown involved, which I think he is a must they play after Rashawn, or after Justin Evans, rather had that putrid game. Reed Blankenship is phenomenal. I mean, he is just the heartbeat of that defense right now, especially with Nicobe not there, but you lose four guys at safety and linebacker that all had their best seasons last year. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Teams are going to take advantage of the middle of the field. And now without N'Kobe Dean, if you're a smart offensive game planner, you are attacking the Eagles where they are the weakest. It's not outside because you still have Gary Slay playing at a ridiculously high level. Thought of Ante Maddox had some great moments yesterday. They're going to attack those weak spots. Josh Job is going to have to step up. Why? Because of an injury. Christian Ellis and Zach Cunningham, are going to have to hold themselves accountable and play better than they did last week. Why? Because of an injury. But that's the National Football League. The so Baltimore Ravens are, aren't crying. Cleveland Browns aren't crying with you. They just lost Wyatt Teller. Every team loses players in the Eagles as much as anybody. 2017, we are not going to be the show nor the team that complains about injuries. Yeah, we you dealt have with it to for find four a years. way. We dealt with it for four years at a historic level. And th mm. Again, you got to find a way as they did in the past, and they're going to have to do it again Thursday night against the Minnesota Vikings. The good news is Fletcher Cox, who was down for a bit in that fourth quarter, he is fine after some friendly fire. Mm -hmm. Looks like it was just a bone bruise on his rib. He should be go to, good to go for Thursday night. And we're going to talk more about Fletcher Cox and that defense defensive line coming up next stock up coming up week one edition after a big win 25 to 20 over the new england patriots guys today's show is sponsored by FanDuel. get ready for the nfl season with incredible offers from FanDuel, america's number one sports book right now new customers can bet five dollars and get two hundred dollars back in bonus bets guaranteed plus all customers who bet five dollars will get one hundred dollars off nfl sunday ticket from youtube and YouTube TV. I just got Sunday ticket. I needed that for sure from FanDuel. Now is the best time to join FanDuel. The app is easy to use and you can bet on everything from spreads to player props and more. So visit FanDuel.com slash LockedOn and kick off the NFL season with an offer that you won't want to miss. FanDuel, the official partner of the NFL and the Lockdown Podcast Network. 
All right, Eagles fans, we're continuing on this Tuesday edition of the Lockdown Eagles podcast. Shout out to our everydayers for making us your first listen Monday through Friday. Pumped to have this series back. We've been doing it for six seasons now, Gino. It's stock up, stock down. We're going to start with stock up because although it was an up and down game for the Eagles, I think there were a lot of positives to get into, especially on the defensive side of the ball in this game. And that's where I want to start. I mean, we should just say stock up in general to the entire defensive line, but I want to mm-hmm. highlight mostly the defensive tackles. I mean, with how good Jalen Carter, we talked about him on the post game show yesterday, but then you see all the numbers come out this morning from next gen stats and all the film review. The kid led the entire NFL, not just rookies, not just defensive tackles, the entire NFL with eight pressures. He had that sack. His eight pressures, by the way, were the most by any rookie defensive tackle in a game in the last five years. And then you look at Jordan Davis forcing the fumble, getting a sack on that final drive, Fletcher Cox's late game heroics, Milton Williams' pressures. The interior was unbelievable on Sunday. The service I use even had Jalen Carter at nine pressures. So not okay. There we go. It kept going up. At first it was at seven, <laughs> yeah. eight, and now we're talking maybe nine. Regardless, if it, it if felt it's like between nine, six, ten, eleven, I don't care. You you had a great tweet saying, "Yeah, he's gonna go and win the defensive player of the year if this keeps up." And there's or defensive rookie of the year rather. And there's no doubt about it in my mind. He's a he should have been a top three pick. The rest of the NFL is crazy. I was giggling to on get Sunday. There. I'm like, oh, I yeah. can't believe he's an Eagle. I We used to talk about it on the show during the draft in March and April, and I'm like, this feels still like a pipe dream when we say it. And the fact that it happened is unbelievable. Literally insert my maniacal laughter from draft night and uh, why I was doing exactly that. It was because of this scenario right here, where with 58 seconds left on the clock, not only did we cash a plus 600 ticket over at FanDuel for Jalen Carter right. recording a sack, but... He did it in a huge spot with 58 seconds left. Javon Hargrave needed who, to Gino? hold them. Yeah, somebody had a tweet today that it's like Javon Hargrave might be the best player the Eagles lost, but they might feel the least impact at that position simply because so true. of so Jalen Carter and Jordan Davis. I thought he just had as good of a game as Jalen Carter did, right? He had that fumble on Ezekiel Elliott to be that big of a human being. You're seeing guys that size, right? You're, you're thinking back in the day, like a zero tech, just a big fat dude, like Tony Saragusa, right? Jordan Davis is in. And you see him, you see him laying out like that completely arm stretched. And by the way, he had to shed a block. He had alignment all over him that he just shoved to the side. The amount of double teams he took on Mm -hmm. Davis, he made the impact plays we needed to see the force fumble, the sack. He had six total tackles, it was an unbelievable performance. And then Fletcher Cox, man. I mean, Carter and Davis, that was the most exciting part of the win on Sunday because they're the future of this defensive mm-hmm. line, 100%. But then when you look at Fletcher Cox, that third and fourth down, the huge run stop on third and short, then the next play, him and Hassan Reddick pressure Mac Jones, who had an open receiver potentially for a first and goal setup, which could have cost the Eagles the game. I mean, Fletcher Cox stepped up. He was fourth in pass rush win rate, by the way, in the entire defensive tackle circle week one his get off of 0.72 seconds to pass the line of scrimmage was nearly up there with Nick Bosa and Miles Garrett it was in the top 10 of the NFL I mean Fletcher Cox stepped up too and Milton Williams had some underrated plays I think Milton Williams might be the most underrated player on that this pressure team he had on third down yesterday. in the red zone was it, it it was unreal and you have to not only deal with Jalen Carter who can do everything exceptionally well right and Jordan Davis who is just not a normal type of player to deal with but then you have a change-up pitch of a Milton Williams and a Fletcher Cox who's so experienced and even Marlon Tui Pelotu and Contavia Street they got five snaps apiece but they were in there for a big moment in the fourth quarter and they did an exceptional job and I mean the whole defensive line they know this team runs through the D-line it is evident But great job to Howie Roseman, man. You know he was up there in that press box. I know there was a lot of nerves during that game, but you know he had that old Howie Roseman snicker going on. He's like, because this is what he built for. Davis and Jalen Carter and Milton Williams. Are you? You know, by the way, another start or stat for Carter: second highest pass rush win rate among all defensive tackles yesterday. Only or on Sunday, only behind Jonathan Allen. I mean, it's like the fat that pass rush get off stat. So. I mean, listen to this. Miles Garrett had the fastest at 0.58. Then it's all Eagles. It's Josh mm-hmm. Sweat at number two, Jalen Carter at number three, Hassan Reddick at number four. Then at seven and eight, it's Fletcher Cox and Milton Williams. I mean, Hassan Reddick, too, stock up to the entire defensive line. Reddick had a very underrated play. That fourth and three, he's the reason Mac Jones did not get that pass off, which would have set up potentially the go ahead touchdown. You won't see it in the stack column with him and Josh Sweat as much, but. 
there the pressure was there when they needed it. Again, it wasn't all game. It wasn't as much as it probably should have been against three backups, but it was there when you needed it. The thing with the backups is they did an exceptional job in terms of New England counteracting that, getting that ball out very quickly out of Mac Jones' hand. He was at 2.52 seconds in terms of time to throw according to next-gen stats, which is lightning quick, and that's how you counteract that. But they were hitting that rock all game. I keep using that term, and that's when the pressures will come, right? Like, you're going to get them in bunches when you continue that formula. If you continue to get off the line of scrimmage as well as you did, continue to pressure the quarterback as well as you did, when you make a quarterback hold on to it for 2.7 to 2.9 seconds, that's when you're going to hit home. How many times did Mac Jones almost get sacked yesterday? I mean, that's oh, yeah. the story of the Eagles front four forever is how many almost sacks they have. But it was evident last year there were games when they didn't have those numbers and then they started to come in bunches, right? Like that Carson Wentz game, that's going to come. It's going to inevitably come because you can win every one-on-one, every two-on-one matchup with those guys that you have in the equation. I agree. Gino, I think stock up as well. When you go back, again, it wasn't a great game when it comes to the middle of the field at safety and at linebacker, but Reed Blankenship was as advertised. He's been one of the most hyped players all summer, and he looked like it. He was the third highest graded defender for the Eagles behind Jalen Carter and Jordan Davis. PFF ranked him as a top five safety on Sunday. When you look at the coverage he had in that end zone play on third and four, that huge tackle against Zeke, Blankenship was all over the field. I was a little nervous about safety after losing CGJ. Still right now, don't love the fact that Justin Evans is starting, but they have at least a half of that position down pat. I mean, Blankenship looked really good on Sunday. I think the best play came on where he was being held by, I believe, City Sow or yep. Michael Owe. I know exactly what player you're talking about, yeah. And he's falling backwards, and he gets off of the hold and still makes the tackle on Ezekiel yep. Elliott. This guy is the real deal, and people were hyping him up, and Slay said, this guy ain't no milk check. But yeah, you can't take advantage of Reed Blankenship. He is a problem for this yeah. defense in the best way imaginable, and he's only going to continue to step up and – to see him go down, not even get up like he was injured when he was clearly injured, take one playoff, get back on the field because he knew how important he was to this team. Getting him as an undrafted free agent out of middle Tennessee state. Wow. That's, that's huge because you lost Chauncey. You lost Marcus. You could have had a dreadful situation there. And instead you got Reed Blankenship who, if he continues at this rate, Lou, I mean, you got to, lock him up like get a deal done ASAP with this guy for sure and then Gino I think stock up to a guy we didn't really mention much on the post game show but he's the reason you were scoring points how about Jake Elliott I mean this oh, guy's hitting 56 yarders like it's the nothing best. a 51 yarder a 48 yard field goal he was extremely clutch and you needed it because again the offense was sputtering they only scored that touchdown early on Jake Elliott's incredible when you have a weapon like that as a kicker with again he misses an extra point. There's still some times with shorter field goals that he's a little frustrating, but mm -hmm. man, he's got one of the strongest legs in the NFL. And outside of Justin Tucker, if I'm 50 yards plus out, there's no, maybe not another guy I trust more. And he had to deal with the 10 man on the field situation where that could have thrown yeah. him off. And usually and the weather is are... not great. It was raining. Can't imagine the footing was great. Whoa. And he still has Aaron Sipos as says his holder, which is like, that's just bad luck as it is. And Hey man, Sipos he wasn't out terrible and, yesterday, actually. I mean, he, it wasn't stock up, wasn't but it wasn't stock no. down. But John Clark of NBC sports said Jake Elliott is one of the best kickers in the NFL. It's the first time since 1960 that an Eagles kicker made two field goals of 50 plus yards in the second half of a game. He's Unreal. the Eagles all time leader in 50 plus yard yeah. field goals. Oh yeah. And that's from a team that has, David Akers, who's a top 10 kicker of all time. He is truly unbelievable. And this goes back to his rookie year, hitting that 63-yarder against the Giants, which inevitably would bring them to the playoffs. Without this guy, Michael Clay has no job. I mean, he shouldn't have a job as it is. But he scored 13 points for this team. Without those 13 points, you're taking an L. And those are big situations. And does how or Nick Sirianni blink? No, the trust they have in that kid, he said it in his locker room speech. He looked him right in the eye and he said, we trust you. And that's what you need in a kicker. Because in college, you see how bad it is. There's not many guys that could come in and succeed right away. Uh, 
The Niners spent a high pick on Jake Moody, and there are question marks about him. The Eagles lucked into Jake Elliott, which might have been the most important move they have made in the last six or seven years. It's a good point when you think about it. They kind of lucked into him because it was, what, Caleb Sturges? Yes, and he was in the Bengals camp, and they needed to bring somebody in, and he got... I don't know if it was a trade or they claimed him off of the practice squad. I think they claimed him. I think the Bengals waved him or something mm-hmm. like that because their kicker came back and Sturgis was hurt at the time and it worked yes. out perfectly that they needed somebody and they lucked into it's crazy probably timing, a hall man. of fame kicker i was gonna say and he's been great ever since for sure and he's made some huge kicks he was one of the main reasons you won that football yep. game on sunday crazy can i enough. throw two last ones in there sure stock up to the wide receivers best duo in the league lou was oh yeah ever so right on his take about, uh, about this a year and a half ago they were great again the offense entirely wasn't great. A.J. Brown, 7 for 79. That 48-yarder call back, and he still had those numbers. Devontae, 7 catches. That touchdown was great. Yeah, the receivers, even Quez Watkins, you know, I think it, two yeah, really nice first good. down pickups. I thought the receivers looked good. Oh, without a doubt. Which isn't and, a surprise. I mean, <laughs> And that's why you have to be okay with what we're going to talk about in the next segment, which is the yes. stock down of the offense. But when you have guys that can win those man-on-man matchups, I mean, yeah. you're not going to – Great corners against Minnesota. They're going to be in for a tough one come this Thursday because those two guys are at the top of their game right now. And you throw even a little OZ in there and some Dallas Goddard and DeAndre Swift, I think things are going to pick yep. up. All right, Gino, stock down coming up next right here on Locked On Eagles. First, a message from Prize Picks. If you haven't heard about Prize Picks yet, you haven't been listening to this show. So I'll give you the behind the scenes. What is Prize Picks? Well, Prize Picks is daily fantasy sports. It's the largest one in all of America. And if you don't know what it is, you pick two to six players, say, are they going to go more or less than their projection? If you went with the Eagles yesterday, Jalen Hurts under, he went less than his projection of passing yards. I believe he also went under or less than his rushing yards as well. And when you look at prize picks, it's the easy investment you're ever going to make because not only is it fun, quick, and safe to put in money, but you can win 25 times your money during this football season. Next week, I'm rolling with the Eagles wide receivers to go more. I'm rolling with Jalen Hurts to go more, and I'm rolling with Kirk Cousins to go less. Get in on the action today. Go to prizepicks.com slash locked on NFL in all lowercase. That is locked on NFL in all lowercase, and they will match your first deposit up to $100. Go to prizepicks.com slash locked on NFL all lowercase that is, and they will give you a first deposit match up to $100. All right, Eagles fans, we're continuing on this Tuesday edition of the Lockdown Eagles podcast, Stock Up, Stock Down, week one edition after a 25-20 to win over the New England Patriots to get to 1-0 against Stock Up to the entire defensive line. Jalen Carter, Jordan Davis, Fletcher Cox, Josh Sweat, Hassan Reddick, Milton Williams, the list goes on and on. Jake Elliott stepped up, Reed Blankenship, A.J. Brown, and Devontae Smith. Gino, there was a lot of bad, though, in this game as well. You're up 16-0. You had no business having to make three key red zone stops late in the game to pull off this win. They just, I think they really shot themselves in the foot, and that's what we said last week. Like, how do the Patriots win this game? Really, when you look at the rosters, the only way is if Bill Belichick has an incredible game plan, which he did, Mm -hmm. and the Eagles just make mistakes. And that's definitely what they did. And I think the thing that bothered me the most definitely stocked down to the coaching. When you look at special teams, just how often Mike Clay, and again, you've been on this for years, you know, he has too many men on the field. Then they take a timeout, and they only have 10 guys out there. And the punt coverage isn't good. The kickoff return coverage isn't good. I mean, it was unbelievable. And then you look on offense – the play calling from Brian Johnson did not like it at all. There's a lot that didn't make sense. But the thing that bugged me the most was the personnel usage. Like, why is Kenneth Gainwell being featured as much as he was? Why is Rashad Penny getting scratched in mm-hmm. this kind of weather? Why is DeAndre Swift only getting two touches? I mean, for me, Kenneth Gainwell is a good change of pace running back. But to me, he is not a Miles Sanders like bell cow. And for him to get those many that many touches, I mean, he was the third lowest graded player on offense, according to Pro Football Focus. So I like Kenny G. I don't think he's extraordinary enough to where he deserves to be featured in that way over guys like Swift and Penny, who I just think are more talented. This happens to be a recurring theme, and we've mentioned that week one is usually odd for the Eagles for, in the first couple weeks. I think week one for running back in general, Gino, most teams I don't understand the game no. plan. Like Atlanta but, did this, Detroit, it, it yeah. was weird. If you look back to that, I think it was Kansas City game, the Super Bowl year, and LeGarrette Blunt got two touches the whole game. It was all Darren Sproles, yeah. 
And then they ran the hell out of them down the stretch and they figured it out. And it's yeah. like, yeah, Rashad Penny probably would have been a pretty good piece in that game to have. And DeAndre Swift is electric. You saw that in the preseason when he's behind a makeshift offensive line. And Kenny G, I'm a big proponent of him. I do like him a lot, but he's a committee guy. Like, that's what it is. Okay. And that's the I approach. Agree. They've never been a bell cow style team. And to see that, it, it was odd. And in a matchup based game where you knew Bill was going to try to exploit every single matchup, you had to do that and counteract that. And you clearly got out coached. Bill Belichick and that yeah. staff out coached you yesterday. And this team won in spite of that coaching staff, without a doubt. Sean Desai, I think you got to hold him in a little different. He was put in some precarious positions with the yeah. turnovers, with the special teams. But offense, inexplicable. They need to get it together. Yeah. Special teams, Mike Clay. I don't know what I don't trust that he can get point. it together. Yeah, you know, at this point they're winning. That's why that's why yesterday, Lou, I, I tweeted this like it's the last drive, put the ball in Jalen Hurts' hand, let him go seal the deal, right? And he would fumble and then they would do it again and they would go for it on fourth down. At no point would I ever want to put the ball in the hands of my special team coordinator who had five mistakes throughout the game. There's no way that yeah. you as a reasonable football fan should say, I don't want Jalen Hurts to have this opportunity to potentially win the game, even if he strikes out. So what? The ball no, is I was in the hands that. of your best player. Yeah. No, I was with that. I was with that decision for sure. I think on defense, again, Sean Desai, I thought I had a good game plan. The only part I had a problem with was just Justin, Justin Evans. Evans. Yeah. I don't understand. And again, maybe there was things in training camp that I didn't get to see myself. So I don't really know in the preseason. I don't think he stood out compared to the other safeties. I'm not sure why he was out there. Not even just over Sidney Brown, but over Terrell Edmonds for the majority of the time, he looked lost the majority of the game in coverage, man coverage, where he was supposed to be in zone. Mm -hmm. uh, that was per perplexing to me. Yeah. Most of the personnel decisions that there were, you know, decisions on in all three phases that I wasn't quite sure about. So yes, the play calling, which we dove into a lot last show with Brian Johnson was concerning and that needs to get a lot better, but it was just, again, who they chose to feature. There was mm -hmm. just some head scratching logic there. Definitely was. And I like that you put the ball in the hands of your wide receivers more. I would have liked to see, especially yeah. with all that zone that they were running, a little bit more motion, try and get those guys some free yeah, releases in space. Yeah. There wasn't really like, much. I don't know, Gino, with, with Dallas Goddard having no touches, he's being double teamed, but try forcing a screen to him just to get him going. Yeah, not know. one I mean, tight end. That, they were begging you to throw a tight end screen. They, yeah. were, they were staying off, letting yeah. you throw everything underneath. All you needed is hit a screen, get three or four offensive linemen downfield, yeah. open up a zone, and you're gone. And that was perplexing to me. And in the fourth quarter where they go a stretch where you need to pick up a first down and they go run, 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 and a second run on second and 10. And and then a, another run with Jalen Hurts with no lead blocker. And it's like – Didn't make any sense. Jalen Hurts is not 2020 Jalen anymore. Yeah, they were getting – still cute. at 67% completion percentage yesterday, even on a poor yeah. day. Just didn't feel like they were in a rhythm or they really, you know, Hertz mentioned identity specifically. Didn't feel like they knew who they were as an offense a lot of the time. And it felt like early on they were up by 16, so they just wanted to end the game. And it was a very conservative approach from coaching. Yep. I will say also, though, too, from Jalen Hurts. And, you know, I think this was a stock down performance from Jalen. Again, if this is the floor, this is still not 2021 wild card Tampa Bay Buccaneers mm. Jalen Hurts from a passing perspective. But now he's held to a higher standard. Like, he's an elite. He established himself last year as an MVP candidate. Had one of the best performances in Super Bowl history as a passer, specifically, not just as a runner. So now, was yesterday's or Sunday's game abysmal? No. But for who he's supposed to be now, he has to be better. Not just the fumble, which you just mm. cannot have in that spot. But just the pocket presence, he felt jittery. He wasn't feeling pressure well. I think he wasn't seeing the field well going through his progressions. He missed a lot of open receivers down the field. So I think he was just too easy to bail on plays and be conservative. Maybe some of that was on Brian Johnson too. But you know, again, for who Jalen Hurts is supposed to be now, this felt more like a 2021-like showing than 2022. I'll end it with this from Shield Kapadia. The Eagles 251 yards on offense today were Good fewer start, than yeah. they produced in any game last season and second lowest since the start of 2021. Yes. Based on EPA per drive and success rate, this offensive performance was worse than every game Jalen Hurts started last mm -hmm. year. That can't happen again. I think Jalen, right. out of anybody in that building, is going to hold himself accountable. Yeah. He's still a top three quarterback in the league. Oh, we know again, he's this going wasn't to turn like, it around. It's this wasn't a Carson Wentz one. 2020 performance. I mean, no. 
you were doing some film study today on Twitter and, you know, you showed the throw to A.J. Brown that got called back, but it was a perfect 48-yard dime where Hurts he stays patient in the pocket, keeps his eyes downfield, and puts it on a rope. I love that second right down. Pressure right in his grill. Yeah, I love the drive before that second down, first down conversion where Hurts is rolling to his right off an RPO, comes back across the field, sees Devontae Smith, fits mm-hmm. it into really tight coverage. The touchdown was elite. The Houdini third down run was great. So, again, Hurts still had his moments. It was just too inconsistent for who he is and for the money he's making now. Jalen Hurts is a player that wins you games. Yeah. And he can also, when he has a poor performance, take you out of games at times. Yeah. And that is the variance of guys like Josh Allen, the Lamar Jacksons. But 10 times out of 10, I will take Jalen Hurts over McCorkle Jones any day of the week, Lou, because I look at that situation, that Houdini third down, who makes that play outside of Jalen and maybe two oh, other guys. you need a player to be able to do that, for sure. And again, you do mention like that kind of player sometimes can have that variance, but of all the mobile quarterbacks, Jalen Hurts, I think, is the best at being safe. And so that's mm-hmm. why that fumble can't happen, but I do trust of anybody. He's the one that that doesn't really become a habit. With Carson Wentz, it was a habit. Michael yep. Vick, other mobile quarterbacks on other teams too. With Jalen, I do trust he'll get it right. So that's the thing with these stock downs is, like on defense, I'm genuinely concerned about linebacker. That's a mm. stock down that I'm like, I don't know if that's going to get better with, with the personnel they have. But on offense, it's Jalen Hurts. It was an uncharacteristic game. The offensive line was stock down. It was an uncharacteristic game from Lane Johnson and Jordan Maialata. I think Brian Johnson, won. huh? <laughs> and you still won. And you still that's won. the crazy part, right? I think Brian Johnson is a good play caller. So I, you know, we don't know, but I don't think he's going to be Mike Grow or Carson no. Walsh as a coach. You know what I mean? So I do think they have everything they need still on offense to turn it around, and they're just too damn talented to not score. So I think yeah. they're going to bounce back Thursday. I don't doubt it at all. Yeah. It's week one. It is the exact scenario as last season's week one. I Very mean, very much so. You score early. You get out to a hot start. Things turn around. The Lions hold on. only come within th- – I didn't realize they scored 35 points in that game. Like, oh, it was a shootout. Yesterday is way better performance defensively than it was last year. And at the end of the day, who did you turn it around against? Kirk Cousins, who stinks in prime time against the Minnesota Vikings. Get the ship right. Thursday's going to be a big one. But coming out of that game with a win instead of a loss, especially with some of those injuries, I think it feels pretty good that if that's the floor, we're going to have a pretty good season here in Philly. All right, we got a quick turnaround. The Eagles play Thursday night, so tomorrow we are going to go d- deep into the matchups between the Eagles and Vikings. We've got crossover Thursday as well from with Luke from uh, Locked On Vikings. Then Friday we got a post game show for you. So the Eagles, they're coming up soon in just a few days. We got you covered right here on Locked On Eagles. Part of the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day. Shout out to our everydayers for making us your first listen each and every day. Until tomorrow, I'm Louis DiBiase signing off. As always, alongside Gino Camilleri, thank you for downloading, thank you for watching and listening, and let's go, Birds. Fly, Eagles, fly.